Okay, we are on YouTube again. Uh, and this is the House Healthcare Committee. It's Tuesday, April 20th. It's a little after one. And uh, we are convening a little early today, in part because um, there's been a request that I come down, come down. I keep acting like we're in the building, like I come down to the next floor down, uh, but that uh, the Institutions and Corrections Committee is also wanting to look at our amendment, which, and uh, Representative Emmons, chair of that committee has asked if uh, Representative Coffey could join us on our Zoom today uh, as we were doing our final review of the amendment language. And so welcome, Sarah, fun to have you here. Uh, and somewhere around uh, 2.30 or so, uh, I anticipate that, that I think in, depending where we are in our own discussion, uh, I will uh, join their committee to review what we're doing in the amendment. So you should, members should have gotten a copy. Did everyone get a copy of the uh, latest? So Katie can't be with us today because she is being pulled in as per usual. I think three different committees had asked her to be there and I assured her that we would, that we, so first of all, I want to appreciate Katie's work on this yesterday and over the uh, over the weekend and yesterday to get this for us. Uh, but she was is not able to be here with us. So I thought um, we we had a fairly thorough discussion on Friday, and there were numbers of suggestions that were put forward. So I think that the, what I'm looking at right now is the copy that she gave us with the highlighted areas, which are the new changes uh, subsequent to what we looked at last Friday. So given that there's no one from Ledge Council to walk us through it, I'll just take the liberty of guess of just kind of giving us a, a walk through and, and, and along the way, invite people to, you know, raise, ask questions and then we'll have some open discussion and uh, if we need to. And my hope is that uh, by the, you know, it, hopefully in the next hour and a half that we come to some closure. I think we need to come to closure on this so that we can make a recommendation. And our recommendation is really to the House Judiciary Committee, but uh, also Corrections and Institutions has asked to see our amendment as well. So um, I'm gonna start on page eight because that's, because you had asked to have it put in context, which was I think reasonable request, but uh, pages one through seven are really the House Judiciary Committee's amendment. Uh, and so I'm going to start with page eight, which is the beginning of section five, which is where we began uh, making some changes. And I think there's actually one change that wasn't discussed on Friday, but I think, Ann, I'll ask you to comment on it. You'll see it on page eight, line 17, uh, at least as I have it. Ann, you're on mute. I was, I was trying to go and open the document from my other yeah. source, which meant I didn't see the screen, so I couldn't unmute right away. It took okay. a minute. So let me go, let mm -hmm. me go uh, open it so that uh, I am ready to comment. Um, and I think the change is from current to currently available. Oh, right. Yes. And oh, yeah. No, I, I can explain that. With, yeah. That's just yes, I, I can explain it without seeing it before yeah, I get I, I thought you could. it. Open. <laughs> sure. When when we had first talked about adding that phrase about don't use this co to compare to the community because we know the community is underfunded and we don't want to use that as the baseline. And I think uh, Katie had had captured it pretty well. But when I reread it um, freshly, and read it just as um, the current community system, it, it still could, it could be read as saying the current community system isn't using best practices um, as if it was a criticism of the system. So my suggestion was to change it to the currently available to, to make that clear distinction. That seemed, that seemed to, that worked for me. And so I said, just put it in the draft and we'll see. I'm gonna keep moving through unless, so if you have questions or comments, I'm gonna ask you just to either chime in or raise a hand or whatever. Uh, 
I, the next change in this draft is on page nine. And I think, Woody, this is in response to a request that you'd made to not use the term Vermonters. Uh, and uh, you're muted. I think it was art, but that's fine. Oh, I'm sorry. Pardon me. Was art. Was it? Yeah. Okay. Apologies. Uh, in any case, that's, I think that's responsive to that. Um, I have a question. Sure. This is earlier in the bill. I know it's not our area, but they keep saying psychiatrist and psychologist if applicable. And I didn't understand that distinction and what that meant. Okay. Um, I'll go defer to Ann. Sure. That, that was actually changed uh, based on, I, I had told you folks, I gave some testimony and recommendations under my personal hat rather than the committee. And that was something I recommended because if a person is being evaluated um, for uh, um, intellectual disability rather than mental illness, then it's usually a psychologist who's involved. Um, whereas for mental health, it's a psychiatrist. So that was, um, that was why Dale got included in various spots. And that was that specific reference to, and if applicable, a psychologist. So a, a person involved always gets involved by a psychiatrist, but sometimes people get a psych evaluation by a psychologist. Is That's that right? The, the psychiatrist would say, "Oh, wait a minute. You know, this is a co-occurring, or this is primarily we need a, a psychologist to do the, to do an evaluation." Okay. Thank you. I have a question about page nine. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, if it's okay to ask as we oh, go. Well, 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 let's let's. Is that is that wrap that up for you, Leslie. Yep, okay, Brian. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I assumed it wrapped it up for you when I jumped in, sorry. Um, so, it, you know, it, in section five, it's talking about this evaluation that will be um, done. And when the word was changed to put in Vermont residents, um, you know, I, I understood it as, um, you know, Vermonters is about someone's identity versus where they live. But as I think about this section more, and I we may have talked about this a little bit last week, but, we're asking that um, they look at the a comparison of services and how they differ between correctional settings. Um, and it says provided to, when it says provided to Vermont residents in out of state facilities, I guess like my question is, we don't really clarify, is it Vermont residents who've gone through the Vermont court system and were placed in out of state correctional facilities or are we looking at all Vermont residents which could be people who live in Vermont who committed a crime out of state and are being sent to a oh. correctional facility or who committed a federal crime and are being going to a, and so I just are we looking at all of that or are we only looking at the services for Vermont residents who went through the Vermont court system and are being placed in out of state correctional facilities you see what I mean like it's really being picky but it's unclear to me. Yes, I think, well, can I say that my understanding is what we were trying to do was to be consistent with those Vermont, those, those persons from Vermont who are in an out of state facility under the supervision of the Department of Corrections. Is that that's what other people's understanding was as well? Yeah. What, if, what about people who aren't from Vermont, but get or don't live in Vermont, but they get um, convicted of a crime in Vermont and are then sentenced into the Vermont correction system, are we not going to look at their care? Because then if, if, if because then they may not be Vermont residents. And so I guess I'm questioning, like, is it Vermont residents or is it like Vermont, I don't know if this is the correct term, inmates or um, Vermont people in super, in, in, I don't know how you put it. Maybe our corrections and institutions member has a better term for what they would use in their committee. But I, I'm only asking, I know it's nitpicky word thing and it's not a big deal, but as I was reading it more carefully, it stood out to me. So that the second part of your question, Brian, I think that wouldn't actually matter because since we're looking at what the mental health services are, unless we had a group of non-Vermont residents convicted in Vermont sent together to one correctional facility outside of Vermont, it doesn't matter because they, they would be mixed together. And we're looking at the, the facility services, not what an individual receives. 
the, the whole study is about what are the available services? How long might you have to wait to see somebody? What kind of uh, professional care and so forth? So I don't think the second part actually matters. My own view on the first part is you're absolutely correct from a, a language point of view, but I think that there's a lot of understanding from the administration, from corrections and so forth about what it is that we're trying to look at. So I don't, I don't know that we need to, you know, fix that to make it precise. That's just my one person. Uh, okay, Alyssa, and then. No, I just want to, I mean, on that same theme, because I'm not wild about the Vermont residents, because how long are you in an out of state facility before you're no longer a resident of Vermont, you're a resident of wherever the out of state facility is. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's lots of people within the custody of the Department of Corrections in Vermont that are not residents of Vermont. So, I mean, shouldn't it, shouldn't it just be provided to those under the custody of the Department of Corrections? Yeah, I think that's right. Those, those from Vermont, yeah. Well, not even those who are under the those under the Vermont, Vermont Department right. of Corrections. Yeah, I think your I think your point's well taken. Uh, You're getting to what I was getting at too yeah. with the language there. So yeah, Sarah, do you want to? Yeah, I was I was just going to say the language that we use in the corrections world is those under the custody and care of the depart the commissioner of the Department of Corrections. So I think what Representative Black is suggesting is probably consistent with that. And so I, we can uh, fix it now so that they don't fix it downstairs when it gets to them. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so I, but I think, so I think you, the point you've raised, Brian, is it had layers of possible interpretations. And I think uh, what, at least what I'm hearing, and now it would be great to have a legislative council person here, but we don't. So we'll. So I'm writing it down. We're we're gonna keep keep careful notes. Okay. So we have uh, persons under the custody of the Department of Corrections, or was it persons, or I forget. We'll try that, and then Katie yeah. can fix it up. Yeah. And then it, it needs to say something like placed in out of state or yep. uh, placed in out of state correctional facilities. Are placed by the Department of Corrections in our state facility, something like that. Okay, got it. But if they're in the custody of the Department of Corrections, I, I would think that would cover everyone. You know what I mean? Yeah, we don't have to repeat. State in state, it wouldn't matter. We don't have well, to repeat. Well, no, but this, but the, this particular phrase are is specific to those. What's available to those who are in the out-of-state facilities? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But we, we don't have otherwise, to. Report. Otherwise, it would be. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But we don't have to repeat. We don't have to repeat the Department, Department of, of Corrections, Corrections twice. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm going to turn to page ten. Was there, was there anything else on page nine? I, I, I printed mine out so I can look at it. And I, is that the same way it's on the screen, I think? Like yes, page, the page numbers are the same. I'm scrolling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Uh, and on page 10, I think we took the lead of the Judiciary Committee and added in this draft to the people that they suggested for the committee, for the working group, the Superior Chief Superior Judge and the Vermont Medical Society in lines three and 12. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to remember if we discussed that with the committee or what, if it was when Lori and you and I met with Katie on the language at the end, that rather than having something we brought to judiciary, which then they had pieces they had already thought of, or we would just integrate them. So well, I think we talked about some of them in committee, actually. Maybe we did. <laughs> because okay. we talked about the, uh, so or the racial equity issue in committee, I'm fairly certain. Are people remember? Uh, yeah, maybe, but but I think in terms, well, whatever. Those two were specifically because they were in judiciary's uh, dra draft, so. Yeah. 
And I, to be honest, I'm not entirely clear what our direction was from judiciary in terms of whether, I mean, they gave us their copy of the draft and we've integrated some things and we'll claim them. I mean, and if they, it, I don't think too much matters where it's coming from at this point, they have it in their draft. Uh, Representative Gold, Leslie, we're going to be more, we're going to be more informal now since it's just us. Oh, just good. I like that. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at the bottom of page nine and it, I, and this has just helped me understand how these working groups get organized. Um, when it says including as appropriate, what does that mean? Who decides what's appropriate? Um, is that just the department or like the commissioner? Um, Where, what line are you on? I'm back on page nine, I guess. I was looking at the working group, um, right the in the forensic. page nine. Yeah, it's line 20. Um, it says, including as appropriate. I just wanted to understand how that, how, how that process happens when the language is as appropriate. Well, I can make a comment. I don't know if it's what other people are thinking, but when I was reading this, after the conversation that we had, the testimony from uh, Deputy Commissioner Fox, there was, in fact, there was some, Anyway, the suggestion was that the Department of Mental Health, which is going to convene this, might actually convene subgroups rather than having the entire group uh, meeting on each, each task that they're assigned. And so that's where I took that to mean, like, you know, there might be one task where it's appropriate to have this set of stakeholders at the table and, and that not everybody has to be necessarily present for every uh, individual task. So is that implied or does it say as appropriate to the task? I mean, I don't even know what the well, right that, language that, that's, that was actually a, exactly the phrase that I think some of us contemplated and it, you know, we could put that in there if that's, you know. Yeah, because I got confused as we went further down about how many working groups and who's doing what and it seemed like there were a lot of moving oh, parts. But, but I don't think, but I think we're, we, we need to find a way to put enough here and then step back from it. But I think if as appropriate to the task, a, a, appropriate to the that, that may complicate it because then you have to say as appropriate to the task do you mean the whole task or the specific uh, task yeah it's probably a bad idea i i um I, and it's not an idea it's just trying to understand yeah. the, sort of the functioning of the work groups um because they will be broken up to address specific problems but it never really says that in there this is this giant list of people right. And it, oh. but maybe that doesn't come from us, and I'm fine with it, that too. It, it, maybe it, it gives the Department of Mental Health latitude, I think. To I think that was the whole point of from the Senate of, of saying as appropriate was to kind of signal that then they could work out how they were going to put those tasks together rather right, than I us. Figured, yeah, I, I just down. figured out how to fix it. If it says convene working groups then we know there are gonna be multiple groups. That's up higher on line 18. I think, yeah. And then it just says as appropriate to work to, you know, meet the, meet the goals of that particular group. Then you, we don't have to change as appropriate, but that was, it just doesn't, it says, it makes it sound like it's one group. And that's what sort of confuses me because it's not, it's gonna be multiple groups. So if I can well, just- but it, it, it is one it is one group in terms of one pool of people and I think ultimately they'll come back on when DMH has a final report they'll be usually giving input and feedback on it so that they may work break up into sub groups of the work group but I think it is still in the overview of a working group that's I was gonna say, I think we've done so many working groups and legislation, agencies understand what we're saying and where they can have latitude is how I, so I. Yeah, you're making me think my... of something else, Lori. You're making me realize if, if, there are, if there are more than one, people are gonna really start rebelling against. We're creating too many working groups. I think, right? I think exactly. we're best leaving it as singular. <laughs> Uh, there's a, we're making a lot of suggestions here to start with. I think we're, <laughs> we're, I'm hoping they'll be open to a lot of them. One question I had, uh, if I can chime in for a second, at uh, the bottom of page nine, it seems like the group is being formed to have input on B and C that follow it. 
and it almost feels like it's backwards. The B and C, should, the, that, that's the meat of it. By this date, the reports will come forward. By this date, the reports will come forward. And if, and, and, and I share, I, I really, really, really share the, the, the feeling we're forming way too many groups, but it, we'll talk about that later. But it seems like maybe the, the working group should come after that. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't think we should. Yeah, I think that's a drafting. Machination is too much. Yeah. I think it's a drafting protocol from Legend. Yeah, okay. Yep, and that's fine. Yep. It just occurred to me that it's funny that the working group and now B and C below what the reason you have it. I don't know. It's it's just different, but that's okay. Yeah, I think that's I think that's more protocol and legislative drafting than anything else art actually. Alyssa, you've had your hand up. Did you have a not regarding that, something else on this page. Which page are you um, talking about? We're still on page, oh, we're on 10, right? Yeah. Nine, nine, 10. Nine and 10, yeah. Working group. So I know that we heard this in testimony um, and we talked about expanding to lived experience within the criminal justice system. But as of last week, we had not changed it from two to three and I see it's being changed to three. Right, and I think that's that's for committee discussion. Yes, um, and I, because we really we had said two in the yeah. course of in the course of the committee discussion. But Wilda, the test that was came out of that testimony from Wilda White. Yeah, that, that her suggestion doesn't mean yeah. we have to adopt it. I just I I just want to seek balance. Okay, I think is. You know, one of the things that I, I, I'm trying to remember that this bill is, it's also a public safety bill. So that's my, that's my only comment. Okay, uh, Woody. Well, just to add on to what Alyssa said about balance. Um, I'm hearing a, a lot about uh, victims not being heard uh, as much as they would like or should perhaps be heard, heard from. And here again, we only have two representatives. I think it's two. Let me see, I've lost my place. Yep, it's two. Um, do we need more? I don't know. Should it be balanced with how many um, individuals that have um, suffered uh, mental illness. Uh, I, I don't know. Just like, so like I, Alyssa said, there should be a balance, I think, between every every group and every one. I'll leave it there. So I'm going to suggest that we do two and two, and it, then it's on his face balanced. And uh, how does that work for people? Mari? So um, I have a, I'm on page 10. Uh, can I bring up something there? Sure. Well, the, the, so is this on the different line than what we were just talking about? Actually, I, on I line 12. I have a comment about the numbers of the balance issue. Yeah, okay, let's, let's finish that discussion first. Yeah, Leslie. If you look at all the officials on there, it comes up to like 10 or 12, which is sort of a pretty big number um, and might be a little intimidating. So I don't really mind having three and three when you think about it in the context of the whole committee. It's like 12 to six. So there's still, I think, plenty of representation of authority. Yeah. And my comment may impact that number. Okay, well then this year, Mari. Um, I know I was um, out ill uh, when we were talking about, um, when we were having some discussion of this, this bill. I'm concerned that there are many um, psychiatric nurse practitioners um, in Vermont um, 
and they're not listed as a possible representative, only a representative appointed by the Vermont Medical Society. Um, and so I'd like to add the Vermont Nurse Practitioner Society. I don't believe that physician's assistants work as um, work in psychiatry. Um, happy to be proven wrong. But I don't want to leave out a substantial part of the psychiatric, um, the licensed psychiatric workforce. I. Right. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 th I think that the focus on it, and partly from the testimony, because it's a forensic, um, forensic work group. I think the focus was on the whole issue of psychiatric evaluations for the criminal justice system, rather than for uh, the issue of uh, treatment generally, because that's more the hospital and um, designated agency roles and who they would bring in, but that was very specific to the, um, the, the question of evaluations, which has come a up a lot in this, um, in the context of this bill. Are we certain that psychiatric nurse practitioners, especially those with PhDs, are not allowed to do these evaluations? Yes. That is, a, that is true by law? Yes. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. Okay. And I think, to be quite honest, I think uh, one of the witnesses we heard from was the president of the Vermont Medical Society, who is a forensic psychiatrist. And I think there was some thought that that was a likely representative who would be appointed by the Vermont Medical Society. I don't think that's a given, but that's, I think that's to bring that expertise or viewpoint to the table. Okay, uh, so on, on line 14, we agreed to change it to two. Is that what we're talking? Uh, number 14, line, uh, line, uh, tw uh, line 19. Well, two or, or change them both to three. I mean, Leslie, your point is well taken. Oh, I, right. I, I, that's frankly why I thought, you know, there could be some lonely voices in the midst of all these, all these, you know, states, attorneys, judges, and bureaucrats. Uh, uh, well, I don't want to call them bureaucrats. But that sounds, that sounds that a bad way. Well, you know, I think one of the advantages of having three and three is that as things get broken into work groups by areas where the different departments have a bigger role and interest, you're going to end up with some that don't have, you know, a victim's advocate or don't have uh, an individual with direct mental health experience. So having more gives more ability to make sure that, you know, you don't have one person who's got to be a part of all the work groups running around as opposed to if they're broken up. So actually I'm warming to that idea. Okay. I also think that if someone, you know, if you have three and one person can't make be part of it, you still have a, you know, a, a colleague or, you know, a connect, someone co connected to your experience. So I like the idea of three and three. Can we just put it to a straw vote of the committee? Because at this point I'm not clear. I mean, I don't think everyone needs to speak to it, but uh, can, I'm going to say how many, for those, those who would support increasing both, excuse me, for victims as well as the uh, <laughs> pediatric survivors of three and three, for those Who's who. Would... <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I see there's an overwhelming support for that. So we're going to change that to three and three. Okay. Anything else on page 10? Okay, turning to page 11. Um, and this is, this, this actually picks up on something that someone was just saying, I think maybe it was, was it Woody? But if I'm getting people wrong uh, about adding, th this was imported from the judiciaries on line 13, consider the importance of victims' rights in the forensic care process. So that, that's an addition that was not uh, in our draft originally, but was in the um, judiciary draft and we imported into this. 
and then um, folks go to that. I'm just kind of looking around. I'm just basically going by nodding heads and raising hands and all that. Okay. Can I ask a newbie question? Sure. What's the difference between a preliminary report and a final report? One's preliminary and the one is no. Uh, no, no, that doesn't help no, me. No, no. <laughs> oh, a part of it, I, I think DM, DMH brought up part of it. I mean, a preliminary report is not necessarily a whole long formal uh, table of contents and so forth. It can be, uh, you know, verbal testimony. It can be an, an overview of what the status is of the work. It's a distinction numbers of agencies of state government are asking us to think about in terms of not having to do as many formal reports every time it says report. And I think uh, for them to be able to come into a committee and give testimony as opposed to spending many hours, you know, making sure it's the complete report. It, it also allows you to, uh, to edit the report before it becomes finalized too. Yeah. make necessary on changes some, on some feedback that you receive as well yeah. and feedback from the legislature into well you really didn't look into this as much because they have a lot of time before uh, completing a, a final report so they can you know pursue some issues in more depth and do follow-up it's really kind of a status report yeah, so is a, a final report locked i mean i would i would wonder if you had a final report but it it, it wasn't sufficient that it would be re you but you would then need more legislation to say go do it again exactly yeah exactly yeah. No, yep. it would be a final report for the what was requested yeah thank you so okay. um, wasn't that also we heard that that they needed more time and that oh. this was a way that we could get a status report preliminary report yes before crossover um, yeah. Before so, yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. So I'm going to. I'm hearing no no concerns or questions. I'm assuming line thirteen is good. Uh, line yeah, going back, going back to line to line six, just to remind people because we don't have it side by side. That was where I had asked that we took out um, reference to the expertise because that. The expertise really goes to the outside experts they're going to bring in rather than experts in forensic mental health on this group. Just refresher of that discussion. Okay, yep, sorry. Uh, and I think we heard in our testimony, I'm getting myself confused here, but I think it was in our testimony. Uh, I think it may have been from Will to White, but to try to include that when we're looking at models of restore, restoring competency restoration models, that they include one, include at least looking at some models that do not rely on involuntary medication. I think her term was forced drugging, but yeah, that uh, was yes, that was Will. Yeah. And so, and so that's where this that's where this came from, and I think there was a general sense to include it. Are there any questions about that? Okay. Anything else on page 11? Okay, I'm turning to page, page 12. Um, so I think there's some language changes on line four and five, but it was most, I think it's mostly to uh, include the, to make explicit what is sometimes not stated explicitly, uh, that those who, because if they're, uh, if they're, if they haven't been adjudicated, they're presumed innocent and making that clear because not falling into the pro, you know, the mistaken language that people who are not adjudicated because they're found uh, incompetent to stand trial or insane at the time of the crime have not yet been adjudicated. They could still have a presumption of innocence and have the right to a full defense. So I think that was to try to incorporate that in line five.
Okay, not seeing any questions in that. Um, line six and seven we talked about earlier. That's that's to include the fact that not all uh, not all the bases for um, not being competent to stand trial or yeah or uh, are, can be based on uh, intellectual disabilities, traumatic brain injury, and dementia. And we've included that earlier. <clears throat> Lines nine and ten were really to make explicit that uh, to see if there are models for forensic treatment that are not facility-based, but that are based in their community. And uh, and I think with the, I think that actually was in the that was actually made explicit in a draft that I saw from the uh, Judiciary Committee and seemed like, whoa, <laughs> that's implicit in a lot of what we're saying, but let's make it explicit the way they did. And that seemed, seemed like a good thing to add. I'm not sure we did discuss this in committee. I think this was something that I, after I looked at that draft, I said, well, let's put this in here and then bring it back to the committee. Does that, I mean, for me, it seems consistent with all of what we're talking about. Okay. Uh, I just I was just going to say sure. initially I think it stated that there was a need for a forensic treatment facility, right. and we discussed whether that should be there, as as you were saying. Uh, yeah, and I think we I think and actually I think then when we get down to I'm going to skip over 11 through 15 for a minute, Woody, and going down to uh, in lines 19 and 20, it says as to whether a forensic treatment facility is needed in Vermont. And I think, again, I picked this out of the judiciary draft because I think it made it even clearer about whether or not there is need. So that was that was kind of picking up on that, Woody. Um, so then back to lines 11 through 15. Um, That was somebody on the committee. We discussed that. I can't remember who it was who was saying, shouldn't we have a Oh yeah, I think catch all a, a, an additional and anything else you think of. I don't remember who said that, but was that somebody, Lisa? Was that I knew, I I do remember I think it was Lori. Lori, okay. Was it Lori? I just, I just did <laughs> the whole gardens are... thing. Oh <laughs> so her her comments were more memorable because she <laughs> included gardens. <laughs> Okay, I apologize to people who are not giving the appropriate, uh, whatever the word is, I'm not sure credit is what you'd think, but. <laughs> okay, Lori, does this capture what you were? Yes, thank you. Okay, and I still don't think gardens should be in, but anyway. <laughs> uh, I can't wait to introduce a bill with gardens in it now. <laughs> Okay, any other questions on page 12? Okay. So page 13 doesn't have any newly lit up anything, but is there anything else on page 13 that people are out to mind? Otherwise, I'll go to page 14. Okay. Um, oh, okay. So I think this was actually some of this we'd seen, but it was reworked by Katie in terms of structure. And it also incorporates, again, excuse me. Um, oh, okay, it has several things in it. And I, and I think the first A is what we talked about in committee about, because that was in the Judiciary Committee draft or something akin to that. And we, we all said, yes, actually, we should have included that. We shall include that. Uh, and then B, I can't remember if that, I think that came up in committee, but I can't be honestly sure. Um, yeah, we. I think we discussed Wilda. the. Yeah, Wilda? I think Will, Wilda, Wilda brought it up, and then I, I oh. dug up that the specific citation, the specific. Yeah. Um, do, do, you want, do you want to say something about that citation so that 
people are familiar with what that that it is in statute and all that. Right. In our in our mental health statutes, um, there there's a section that addresses the the intent of the General Assembly to um, the first part is uh, is about the fact that people have the right to make their own health care decisions unless uh, they lack the capacity to do so. And then this next piece that said it's it is the policy of the General Assembly to be working towards um, doesn't mean it's always possible uh, yet, but to be working towards a mental health system that does not require coercion or the use of involuntary medication. So that's the quote, that's a quote from um, current statute. So it's just, it's sort of making it a, a reminder that that's part of our um, public policy. It's an aspirational public policy. It's not saying that there cannot be, ever be anything, but that is an aspirational high level goal. Yeah, that when, you, when we can, we want to be doing that. Right. Among other things, because there's lots of evidence that that's the most effective. That when people agree to, to the treatment recommendations, it's more likely to succeed, but at any rate. Okay, does there anybody have a questions about including that? I don't see any hands or raised eyebrows. Um, and I and I think two was just part of the partly reworking the language under eight, nine, and ten to make it consistent with the restructuring of the language. That, that that was in the judiciary draft, but it was we, we broke it into the pieces, yeah. Right. And then 11, 12, and 13, again, I think this was picking up on, I think in part, uh, Deputy Commissioner Fox's comments that the department would really want to re reach out to regional and national experts and not assume that all the expertise was within the working group. And right, and that's that's what we included. We asked them uh, how much money they needed for bringing in that expertise, and that's what we included. Um, and then that that had been my when we discussed it. That had been my follow up suggestion to what um, Fox had said is that uh, that we should should put it in the language that there's they they need to be doing this. Yeah. It seems it doesn't seem to be controversial. Okay, uh, lines twenty and twenty one. Uh, I plugged in the dollar amount on the high. Uh, the Department of Mental Health suggested it had previous. I think just been a blank amount, but I believe we did share the memo from the email from the Department of Mental Health saying they suggested twenty to twenty five thousand dollars. So I figured put it on the high end and see what makes it. Um, any other questions on page 14? Seems like such a trivial amount when we think about all the other money that's flying around. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it'll end up with a small amount more that appropriations puts in just to um, for the paragraph above the standard per diem amounts. Um, that only goes to people. Oh, actually, this I'm just realizing this is this is not quite aligned with the language we often see here and is not quite accurate. Gee, um, we don't give per diem compensation to people whose full-time job is to be doing this kind of work, as in somebody from uh, the hospital association or from Vermont Care Partners. They don't get per diems if it's, if it's part of their full-time jobs. There's language we use that yeah I, i've yeah, seen that uh, boilerplate there's yeah, boilerplate well, like basically, basically it says it means if you're not already paid to do this by it's part of your job yes, and it's basically exactly. refer to probably the victims representatives and those with lived experiences who they'd be really referring to because everybody else is has paid employment that'd be doing as yep. part of the job yeah, yeah so and, that, and that, we have standard language we use for that so we just need to inject yeah. that Good catch, Ann. Yeah. 
I was only looking at it because I was thinking I was just uh, from a learning curve point for new members that that 25,000 actually approaches will put in the right amount that aligns with needing the per diems. But then I was looking back to point to it and I said, saw, wait, it only says we're not state employees. <laughs> so it's probably going to be for six people, right? Well, under our current draft, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, right. I don't think there's anybody else on that list who's, um, I think most everybody else is uh, paid yeah. to some organization or the state. Yeah. Okay, anything else on page 14? Okay, uh, page 15. And I'm going to, Sarah, did, Aunt, did Alice have a conversation with you about this? She did. She did with me, and she said maybe you would bring something to our committee. I don't know. Do you want to comment? Sure. So this is this is section seven, the creation of the committee. I'm working off a slightly different version than you are, so I want to make sure we're talking about the same section. I'm talking. I'm talking about the. Actually, this is. Well, let me back up and say this. This yeah. is a committee that exists, uh, and so when it's when it says eight, section seven, eight hundred one, creation of committee, that's re, that's that's current language. Um, but it talked. But I had proposed that the House Healthcare Committee have representation on the Justice Oversight Committee, which it does not currently. So this committee, this section is referring to the Joint Justice Oversight, Oversight. Committee. Just yes. I want to make sure that we're all clear. Um, yeah, that I'm is. clear. So yeah, I think my understanding is that it's often good with these kinds of committees. They want to make sure that they're are also odd, like equal representation from um, the Senate and the House and also diversity of parties represented. And it sounded like a good idea, I think to my chair that mental health be represented in that through, through your committee. I think her suggestion was hoping that, that let me just, uh, that, to see if we could increase the committee to one member at large on the House side and two members at large on the Senate side. Because I think she wanted to be sure that some of the representation, there could be some continuity, we wouldn't lose some continuity um, uh, with, one of the at with an at-large member. Does that make sense? So I think, let me see if I can summarize this. Uh, I had deliberately not tried to increase the size of the committee and there was an at-large membership in the House side currently filled by a second former member of the Corrections and Institutions Committee. Uh, but uh, so I said, well, let's make that the healthcare representative from the healthcare committee. Uh, representative Emmons was saying, I really would like to secure the continuity of uh, that at-large member and therefore I would, I support having a healthcare committee member be part of this, absolutely support that, but would instead suggest that we add still an at-large member, leave it at, that there's an at-large member of the house that then could be filled by former member from the Corrections Institutions Committee and then add that the Senate would also have then two at-large members to have the parity between the House members and the Senate. I, I said, I have no objection to that. I don't know how the Senate will feel about that, but that's, but in terms of a proposal. So that, anyway, that's the proposal that- That's the proposal, that. yeah. I think 12 is still very workable. I don't think that, um, particularly as there's, uh, there's usually always one, one or two who can't make a particular meeting. I, um, so I'm not, I'm not opposed to seeing it um, increased and that, that might make a lot of sense. I don't have a strong opinion as long as the healthcare committee has a seat at the table. No, I'm serious because uh, it's been yeah, frustrating. No, no, that's the been frustrating that recent years, particularly after mental health services were moved to jurisdiction of this committee. Uh, even though I think it should have been the way before, because healthcare, mental health care, is an issue for corrections in many instances, and I think there's someone from our committee should be sitting at that table. I think it's really critical um, with the work that we're doing with justice reinvestment. Um, mental health looms large in you know thinking about how it both inside facilities but also in the community systems of care. Like there's a lot of intersectionality with with that. So I think it would be. I think our committee. That's where our chair comes down. But I think it, 
the committee would be so is, it's a good idea. Right. So any objection from committee members to shift to that model, add one for more Senator, add leave, leave it at large and add healthcare in the house side. Okay, seeing that, seeing that that's generally agreed to as a change. Um, Good question about this. It doesn't say in this paragraph that it's the joint judicial no, I just, yeah. that we're talking about. So I was confused when we got there, I didn't know where I was. So I was that, yeah, that uh, because it's in the middle of another bill. No, it's it's actually it's in the so I, I made a note here as well, Leslie, that it, it should, they they should import the name of the committee into this amendment so that it's clear what committee we're being talked about, uh, so that the heading should somehow reference the joint committee, joint justice oversight committee. Yeah, because it needs one of those uh, guide guide headlines, whatever it's called. Because otherwise, or, it looks like we're we're also going to have a forensic. Yeah, like we're creating a, yet another committee, which we're not. Yeah, doing. yeah. Not well, I called Dan last night and said I don't get it. How many committees are there anyway? So then she explained to me what this was. So thank you, Ann. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, Representative Donovan. <laughs> Being informal. Oh right, we were going to be informal. That's good. I can't. Um, and Can I ask another uh, question, if I may. Oh, when you're done, just, go ahead. Just I had one thought. Um, yeah. So the reason that this is particularly relevant here is that this that one of the reports gets sent to the Justice Oversight Committee. And, and frankly, I think the Justice Oversight Committee will have a role in justice reinvestment going forward as Representative Coffey, as Sarah said, and in any further discussions around forensic, whatever forensic model emerges, I think this committee, the Justice Oversight Committee will undoubtedly have a role in addition to the standing committees. And so that's another reason why I think it's important after doing all right. this. Work, well, whether or not there's a facility, it's going to be a significant um, right. ongoing issue around the, the forensic system. Yeah, right. So community, it's, I think it's, everything. I think it's very important yep. that, that we have full representation there. Okay. Can I ask oh, another Leslie, question? Yeah, please. Now, I got confused also when it's, um, I thought maybe it could be two paragraphs, because when it says in addition to one member at large, I thought you were adding one addition to the 10 members. Um, and that I got confused about that. So could we just say in addition, just say one member at large appropriate, so not add that in addition, so there's, there would be no confusion or am I just the only person that was confused, which is very likely. No, the problem is just that that's existing law. So I can't, if there was gonna oh, be a rewrite. Okay, never mind. Yeah, yeah. I, I it. Would. We wanna minimize the changes in something like that where make the point what we're what we're actually trying to do but again there are times when i i you know when we need to just defer to legislative councils drafting yeah they so okay um i'm gonna see if i can i and you've taken notes about changes, and I've taken some notes. Maybe others have as well. But, well let, yeah, let's just cross. Let's just go through and quickly yeah. summarize the changes that we're recommending, because it'll be important to be able to report that to the. So I've got page nine as the first one. Yeah. Persons, you... persons under the connect, under the custody of the Department of Corrections, placed in out-of-state facilities. Okay. And then page 10, um, the only change was both, both position number 11, which is victims, representatives, and 14, which is um, lived experience, that there would be three, three each. Mm -hmm. And then unless I forgot to take a note when somebody said anything, I don't have anything again until page 14 which is the, um, yeah. or paid by your job uh, language for stipends, per diems. And then page 15, the um, six Senate, six house with uh, right. Senate having two at large and house having one at large and one um, house health care. 
and ideally making reference to what committee it is. Oh, specifically house health care. Yes. No, 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 no. To the okay. justice, joint justice. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I didn't write that down. It, was, it should. Right. Yep. Yeah, I mean, no, that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, I mean, we had discussion on a number of other things, but those, those are the things. Those are the items that I had made notes that we had agreed we would, we'd modify in our final draft recommendation. Okay. So, any. Other comments, discussion? My goal is to try to, depending on whether, I mean, we've had discussion along the way, so I'm not sure. Okay. Um, I'd like to, I'd like to, I'd like for us to take a, uh, to, to actually take a vote on recommending this as an amendment. And uh, I don't think we need to do a roll call on this, but I think we should. I think we should weigh in as a individual committee or as a committee. And uh, so, are people prepared for that? Can I have a few minutes to read it first? I'm just kidding. I've been reading all along. <laughs> I just have to say that because I've asked it a few times. <laughs> okay. I have a question uh, for Anne. Um, I was supposed to get an agenda. It doesn't say possible vote. Does that apply to an amendment or do you not mind that we didn't warn it? If for one, It does not apply to straw polls. If we were taking a formal vote, we would normally give notice that we might be taking a vote. Or if we forgot to and we all agreed to it, we could do it. Okay. I was just curious. Yeah, I know. That is not actually something that's anywhere in the rules of anything. It just it's so it's not a rule. It's, it's, it's not a it's rule. A pro, yeah, it's a protocol around transparency with the public. Um, well, it's also a practice of respect to other committee members so that you're not like not letting them know that a decision point is about to arrive. <laughs> no, and, and quite apart from your question on that, it, which you've asked a number of times, but seriously, in the past, we tried to you know, let people know that this is, and it's also a signal to the committee. We're getting, we're at the point where, you know, be prepared. Don't say I, I uh, whatever. <laughs> so, okay. So I'm going to propose, uh, since we're not, it's not a bill and we're not doing a formal vote, uh, but I'm going to pose the question of uh, those members who as amended, as amended on the record today, we have a number of changes, we just reviewed them. Uh, who would support, want to support recommending this amendment to the House Judiciary Committee for Senate Bill 3. Those in support of the amendment as amended on the record today by a show of hands. Okay. Um, those opposed or not in support. I mean, it's not like active opposition, but I don't know, you want to make a comment, Art? Well, I'd just like to explain why. Sure. Uh, section six, w which we just went over. I support B and C in the parts of D that apply to B. Okay, and those are the reports being asked. Okay, asked of the, of the groups. But A, I just can't go along with any more working groups, task forces, uh, organizations, uh, I think we really re need to rely on our experts to make decisions and, and be done with it. So that's why I'm against it. That, that, that one section, I, I just, we, we've got so many of these, I, I just, enough's enough, so. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I see uh, on a vote of nine, one, one, uh, recommending this to the House Judiciary Committee. And we will take that rec and I think it's useful for us to, to be taking a recommendation to the Corrections and Institutions Committee that this is this is not just a draft, that this is our recommendation. Uh, and asking them to, I mean, uh, giving giving them a chance to review it as well. Okay. A question, uh, Chair sure. Lipper. Sure. When, and this is a process thing. Yeah. We've made a change to a Senate bill, okay, assuming it goes forward, assuming we the House approves it. Does it go back to them again? And now they 
look at it and they could tweak it again. Mm-hmm. And they then do more than they tweak. come back to us or I assume another tweak and they take, they take charge. Okay, so uh, here's how it works. So just to say, there, there are a couple different paths, but they all, uh, yes. So first of all, this is the Judiciary Committee has possession of the bill. We right. don't. Right. So they're going to make a decision about what we've recommended. They could change that and put something different in the bill that they sure. sent to the Senate. But assuming, let's assume whatever they decide is the proper amendment to send to the Senate, they'll take it to the House floor. And then the House floor, we will debate it and we'll vote on it on the House floor. Assume for a moment that it goes through the House floor in whatever form. Then, yes, the Senate, it will go back to the Senate. It will be put on their calendar. The committee that had jurisdiction there, which I think is the Senate Judiciary Committee, will then, they have to review what the House has sent back to them. They could accept it in whole uh, and concur. Then it's done and then it goes to the governor. Sure. They, could, they could say, you know, they could, they could take any part of it and do what's called Further proposal of I amendment. With further proposal of amendment. And then it, then they could take then I have to take it to the Senate floor. They have to vote on it and they send it back. And then it's in the House's hands again in the House Judiciary Committee. Then they can concur and say we're done, or they concur with yet further instance of amendment. Okay. So this can go back and forth like a few times. Okay. Okay. But in, in recent years, and so that's the very formal process, in recent years, it's not unusual at some point for the chairs of the two committees or representatives of the two committees. Before in, you get there, before you get to the recent years, the other piece that can happen yeah, yeah, is yeah. that it's, you don't concur and you, and you ask for a conference committee, yeah, right? Yeah, so you ask for a conference committee and that's a formal committee of three members of the House, three members right. of the Senate. And they have a, there's a set protocol under which you have a conference committee meeting. Yeah. One side chairs the meeting, one side doesn't. Mm-hmm. Decide where, the, when and where the meetings are held. As, okay. as the session comes to an end, and particularly in the second year of a biennium, but even so in this half of the biennium, conference committees are established on different bills. They are publicly posted. Now we're on Zoom world, but uh, if it was in the building, even you can go and sit and listen. You can't ask questions. Only the members of the conference committee can actually participate. But then they there's a sometimes it depends on the nature of the people involved. Sometimes it's a very formal process of proposal, counter proposal. Let's go think mm-hmm. proposal, counter proposal, mm-hmm. or it can be let's sit down. Hey, you know, let's work this out. Yep. And gotcha. so it depends on the personalities and the people involved. Sure. But it can be a very formal process. And that conference committee has to come to an agreement. Well, they don't have to come to an agreement. The goal is for them to come to an agreement. Let's assume they do come to an agreement. Then the agreement has to go back to the body in which it originated. I, this is where I get, I, after all these years, yeah. I'm totally confused. It has to go back to one or the other. It's on, in the rules. It goes back to a certain body first. They have to approve it. Then it gets shipped to the other body for approval. And if both bodies ultimately approve a conference committee report, then it goes to the governor. Gotcha. All right. Thank you. I, it's it's well, wait. Now, <laughs> n- now he's going to, well, now he's going to get to in recent years. So in recent years, <laughs> many, many times, I mean, frankly, it's like, do we really need to go through a formal committee of conference? Can we have some informal discussions outside of a committee of conference and say, this is, we know where we, we can figure out where we're going to end up. And one body, whoever has possession of the bill at that point, makes the changes, puts it in, and the other body approves it. Okay. If, if you'll do, if you'll do this before you send it over and you're willing to do it, then we'll accept we'll what you send. We'll do this, yeah. Or, or for instance. Backroom negotiating. Yeah. No, it's backroom, but it's, it's just, it's called like pre-conferencing. It's like, you know, yeah. let, let's just, let, let's just kind of cut through the cut through the stuff and get to where we need to be. Now, uh, there is there is an element, and you, I mean, you've got a back room, but is it element of the conference committees actually have to meet in public. Uh, they can be observed by lobbyists and, and other members. 
And so the, the, the appropriations, the budget bill, the big bill, almost always has a conference committee. Not always, but almost. I, and, and, they, and there some people feel very strongly that that must be a conference committee in public because you hear what they're moving, what they're doing and not doing. And then frankly, they get lobbied all the way through it by yeah, lobbyists, yeah. by other members who's, yeah. oh, I'm sorry, Brian, I didn't see your hand. Go ahead, Brian. Wait yeah, I, well, I just wanted to say that like, it may sound to people like there's some, there's like this back room thing, but actually we've already done some of it in our work where we look at a bill that the Senate's working on and we talk about it yeah. and we talk about what we want and then they do it. So it's not necessarily back room because a lot of times, it, in fact, it almost always ends up in a committee being talked about yeah. before. Yeah. So yeah. there obviously is going to be off the record conversations between people because we're human and and that's how ideas are shared. But I, I find that, you know, there is a way that we can work to make it as public as possible. And yeah. I, I feel like in general we do. So yeah. it's not perfect, yeah. but in general we do. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And it partly, it's, it's, it's sometimes it's all conditioned on how much time there is between when you're trying to do this and when adjournment is coming and when the budget is ready to go. If the budget and, sets adjournment. Yeah, and sometimes, yeah. So, okay, so we've spent a fair amount of time on this, but as you pointed out, there's no guarantee what we just did is going to end up looking like what we just did. But you want to put into your proposal your best thinking and your best ideas so that there's a chance that, that things will emerge the way you hope to or come some, some semblance of that. And I think we've done a good job with that. I appreciate the input, again, from different members of the committee all along the way. So I'm going to suggest that we, so uh, let me take a minute uh, Sarah, do you have, did you want to weigh in? I'm going to pop out and just thank you for allowing so, me to so join will you. Tell, will you tell your chair I'm prepared to come down whenever, uh, 2.30, whenever? I think where you guys talking about 2.30, I'll let her know. Yeah. Do you would, want a, our committee assistant to shoot you an email or do you? Um, yeah, do you... Send, send me an invitation. Okay, a, great. Zoom, a Zoom invitation. And I'm just really? going to spend a couple minutes. So thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Um, so we have several Senate bills still in front of us. Um, and Lori and Leslie have been working on one of those bills, S-22, I believe. Do I got the number right now? S-22? Stem that cell. we have on our Give agenda. it the name. <laughs> oh, S-22 about stem cells. Stem cells. Stem cell issues. Um, and Leslie had agreed to report that bill. I think that's the way... What, what, the way we worked on it, and, and I asked Lori to work with you on that, just so you had somebody else to work with. Um, and they have been doing some meetings. Well, actually, I'll let you talk about it. And but to say that they're ideally, we're at this point still thinking there may be some testimony on Thursday. We may not come to closure on Thursday, but uh, and then I'll talk about something else that's come on. I don't here. think the testimony is going to work on Thursday because we. Oh. So I, I just said to Colleen to uh, keep it on our list to talk about for next week. Okay, okay. And in the, and so, but then tomorrow we have on our agenda S42, which is the Wellness Commission for Emergency Responders. I think we're pretty close to ready to go on that. Uh, we'll see. Um, I don't think we have any more witnesses scheduled. We've heard witnesses. Um, so that is, I think that's on the agenda with uh, committee discussion and possible vote. Um, so I'm also, I, I, I have deliberately not packed in a lot of other things into this week so that we can try to work our way toward closure on some of these Senate bills. Um, and because I know there's some work needs to go on in the background with some of this, such as Leslie and Lori and Jen and et cetera, getting ready for things. Uh, so I'm gonna propose that when we finish here this afternoon that we adjourn for the day and that tomorrow morning we come back and we'll be here on S stem cell. Oh, <laughs> tomorrow morning is wellness. Oh, I'm sorry, I said it wrong after all that. Uh, I mean on wellness commission, yeah, on wellness commission. Uh, I've been asked to come down 
to the Corrections and Institutions Committee at 2.30 to present this bill, or 2.30 or 3, whatever worked out. And I thought we did what in the time I thought we would need. Um, and then there's another issue that has kind of emerged again, and that is the issue of children and youth uh, and mental health, and particularly uh, what appears to be continuing, if not an increase, in the number of young people in emergency room settings. And so um, we are trying to schedule some additional time uh, ideally on Thursday morning, if we can do it, to try to shine a light that, on something. That is lined up, but that's an update you haven't gotten. Okay, I'm Colleen sure. did reach. So then yep. why don't you or whomever has been working to that, we will we will be turning some attention to that Thursday morning. And that's an issue that number has come up on a number of our discussions and has come up again with some additional uh, external concern being expressed. And we, I, said, yes, let's put some attention there this week, uh, talk with the Department of Health, talk with uh, others involved, because it, it's, it's, a, it's a very important issue. So um, yeah, the Department of Mental Health responded pretty quickly when Colleen reached out to them with three people they want to send. So it's right. clearly on their agenda. So uh, Dr. David Retu, who's with UVM and works with youth psychiatry, um, I don't think he is he may consult with DMH. He's not he's not actually with DMH even, but they they put him on the list along with uh, Deputy Commissioner Fox and Colleen um the third person I didn't recognize the name right away. Um but they they sent three names as people they wanted to send to address the issue. Um and there will be somebody from the hospital association which has actually been gathering information on from their emergency departments and have uh, a number of thoughts about um, some, some pressing issues and way that, ways that there might be uh, to try to begin addressing them. Um, and then we were also going to um, invite, I don't know if Colleen's heard back anybody yet, oh, Laur Laurel Olmstead. That, that rings a bell, but I can't place the name. Um, at any rate, the, the third, um, Vermont care partners, because a big piece of the issue is not just inpatient, inpatient capacity, it's also uh, crisis bed step down uh, capacity. Um, so, uh, so, so let me say this. So if you have other folks you think we could or should invite to be part of that discussion on Thursday morning, would you reach out to Ann, who's uh, working with Colleen to schedule testimony for Thursday morning? Um, are we uh, looking to write a bill? I mean, what do we hope to come out of this testimony? Well, my intention, no, I don't see us writing a bill, uh, but I don't preclude something, but at this point, it would be highly unlikely we'd be writing a bill. But I think it's important at times for us to shine a spotlight on an issue that is needing atten further attention, uh, both from the administration as well as from the legislature, even if there's not an immediate solution at hand. Do we write a press release or how do we get it out? What, what does the spotlight mean, I guess? It means putting it on our agenda, having testimony, and we'll see what goes from there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Woody, you were, were was that? Uh, yeah, uh, Brian, Brian did put in chat. I had, I pronounced the name wrong. It's uh, Omlin, not Olmstead. Okay. But Woody, you, were, you had your hand up. Yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm not going to send out an email when I can just tell you, Anne, um, but I think it might, well, if HIPAA requirements may preclude this, but it would be nice if we had family members of some of these children uh, testify about their experiences um, regarding this issue. So that's my- I think that's a great idea. And actually I have a contact from a person who was at a meeting I was at this morning who this issue is She's with NAMI, it's on the top of her agenda, which probably means she knows some parents who have direct involvement. So I can reach out to her and see. I think yeah. that makes very good sense. Yep. I think Woody, the issue is if, the, if anyone can talk about their own situation 
it's, it's a, it doesn't run afoul of HIPAA if you're not, but it's, if you're talking about someone else's medical records or medical situation, but you're- Although you're, there has been, there has been a change. I'll just comment that I very much appreciate um, that uh, folks like from NAMI have, have, have done over the past decade, really, it's been, I think, a very conscious change because it used to be that um, parents would come in and say, you know, my, when they're talking about adults, my adult son, my adult daughter. And, you know, that's, um, I can speak as somebody, when my parents went to NAMI family to family uh, support about how to address um, helping their daughter, me, you know, that was really personal and kind of, I mean, they're I'm an adult, they're talking about me with other people, I mean, that just was, you know, sends a chill up here. And um, so although they could legally share it, they weren't providers um, and they have made a change where now they will say a family member. I have a family member, which could be a sibling could be, I mean, that opens the door and it's not identifying um, your adult child. Yeah, so. I've really appreciated that effort on their part. Okay. Thank goodness okay. my parents never came to testify in the legislature about me. <laughs> okay. But <laughs> makes you conscious. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm gonna bring this to a close for this afternoon and uh, we'll see you folks at nine o'clock tomorrow morning.